Yes, welcome. This is F a Rap Critic. I'm your boy Malik16, the founder and creator of F a Rap Critic and Plates and Crates and The Rap Ruler and TheRapRuler.com. And I'm here to make a name for myself, but not a name that you fear. There's no need for that. I'm here for the love. Do yourself a favor, go check out TheRapRuler.com, which if you haven't been to in a while, or if you've never been to, then today is the perfect day to go check it out because it is the crux of why this whole channel exists. It's so we can have this one-stop shop to go to, where we can all contribute to the rankings and have the final word on how classic all these classics that we're always talking about really are and where they fit in the conversation. And while you're at it, might as well take a moment to like and subscribe to this very channel. Uh, and I wanna shout out all the new subscribers and followers. Uh, thank you for all the love. It only gets better, stay tuned, stick around. And while I'm at it, you know, we didn't get a chance to really acknowledge it because all the love was pouring in at a, at a rapid pace. Uh, but I wanna shout out OC, the veteran OC, for being the first rapper to come onto this channel and rate his own material, his own sophomore album jewels using our system the system i created and uh while i'm at it i also need to shout out cooler ruler for being officially the first producer to come on the channel and rate his own work uh talking about his production contributions to the debut album from the lost boys when we reviewed legal drug money a lot of times we get guests on the show who you know tend to give fives on a lot of the dimensions here so it's really really dope to see the creators of this classic material and their contributions to overall hip hop culture be really objective about the stuff that they put out there. And, you know, we're talking about everything from, oh, these lyrics could have been better. The, the drums could have been better on this beat. I didn't get the feature that I wanted to get here and we might have overshot our shot. Man, salute to both of those veterans for just being like super clear and, and super real with that. And um, there's more to come. Also, even though we have a tendency on this channel to review a lot of albums from the 90s because we're talking about classics, I know we recently started our Young Classic series. You've seen us review albums by J. Cole, Big Crit, Migos. Just because it's 90s and older, you know, 80s albums as well, doesn't mean that that's where it all ends and, and lands. So, you know, for instance, if we're talking about the two guests that I just highlighted, they're still out there doing work. Kula Rula has heat out there that he just released. OC has some work that he just released and you heard him mention that he's working on his final album. So people claim that they love these guests and they love the work they do. So a lot of people bigging up OC, go check them out, go see what they're doing. They still out here doing their thing, man. The hip hop doesn't die. And that's what being a part of this global hip hop community is all about. So let's keep it going. Now, since I mentioned 90s, Let's do that because we're headed into that time of the year where it's the boys' birthday season and that's where we start getting into albums that I personally like and you only get this little flash of my bias around this season and um, that takes us to the album that we're talking about today which happens to be turning 25 on this very day and we're talking about an album that makes this the second go-round of us reviewing two albums by the same artist. We did it before with J. Cole when we went over Forest Hills Drive and then Born Center. So now this will be the second artist that we're doing the second album review on. The very first time we reviewed an album of his, it was episode 10 where we had my very special guest Swan who helped me come up with the, the concept and the name of the I Used to Love Her shirt because it was one of the songs off that album. and. By the way, this is a shirt that you can cop on the rapruler.com. You can't see it all here, but you can see it all on the site. And while I'm at it, shout out to the boy Divine of Closed Down, the fashion maven himself. Uh, we collaborated some time ago on this hat for the Plates and Crates series. Bottomless, you see the mimosa with the panties. I don't know if y'all can see all that, but we just talked about reissuing these and bringing them back. So y'all let us know if y'all like it in the chat. The hat might pop up on the site, but for now you can definitely cop the shirts. But yeah, with no further ado, we're talking about the album by the artist formerly known as Common Sense, turning 25 today. One day it all makes sense. My personal favorite album by Common. And we're gonna go through category one, where we're talking about the album, the product itself. 
So a little background, this album was released obviously on September 30th, 1997. It is the third studio album by this performer, but the very first album under the iteration of the name Common Without the Sense due to a lawsuit from another act using that name and he had to drop it. Uh, you'll hear references to that throughout this album. Let's get into it. The first dimension we're gonna talk about is dimension one, quality of production. So if anything can be said about Common's production at this point in his career, leading up to it on the previous two albums, the idea was that you'll see this sense of Band of Brothers loyalty, and you're gonna see three names appear religiously on Common's first three releases, and that's gonna consist of Why Not, also known as Twilight Tone, Doug Infinite, and the now legendary No ID. And that's what you're getting with the additional contributions from Spike Rebel, James Poyser, Kareem Riggins, and The Roots. What No ID has grown to become the hip hop culture is up there with the GOATs. And uh, his name rings in so many corridors in the industry that it's like hard to believe that at this point in time, he was seen as exclusively Common's producer. And No ID speaks about this in, uh, in past articles where he talks about that was the, the mindset that they came from at the time. Everybody was kind of tribal in a sense. And he, and he speaks on opportunities he had to work with other people, but how his mind just wasn't there. He actually goes a little further to discuss how at this time he was working on his own solo, which is accept your own and be yourself. And he was viewing it. The vision he had for it was for it to be the Chicago version of The Chronic, which we all are familiar with The Chronic being pretty much the brainchild of Dr. Dre, the DOC, and Snoop Dogg, where it comes that Dre is helming the production, DOC is providing most of the lyrics, and Snoop is the main featured rapper. Even though Dre is on every song, or almost every song, Snoop is really who's being highlighted there. No ID explains that that was his idea, where him and Doug Infinite were going to be playing the role of Dre and DOC, and Common would have been in the Snoop Dogg role, and really putting on for the city with up and coming rappers from Chicago but it never came into fruition. And so we got the finished product, which was the, the final version of No ID Solo. And he said that he was so busy working on that and the changes that came from everybody not being on the same page, that production for this album was an afterthought, which is ironic because No ID produces the lion's share of the beats on this album, no less than 11 tracks. So we'll talk more about No ID in a minute, but first let's touch on the contribution here from the producer Why Not, aka the Twilight Tone. It might be a little evident from his one track on here where he was at with the relationship with Common. We touched on it a little in our review of the Resurrection album where Twilight Tone had described in articles how they were slowly growing apart with each album and by then they were barely talking. So that, that might explain why there's only one contribution. And this is pretty much a straightforward sample. It's a sample um, that has two parts to it, right? You can look at it as a lazy contribution or a very genius contribution because what he does is sample the song Mellow Mellow Right On by Laurel which has been known in Chicago as a Steppers classic. Now, Steppin' is the dance style cultivated in Chicago, which was mostly associated with older folks and, and maybe Chicago party culture until R. Kelly, I don't even know if we can say his name anymore, uh, brought it to the forefront and it became more of this widely known thing with you know his songs and, and his birthday thing. It, 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 at that time, it was a special Chicago staple and so you could argue that there was a lot of thought put into this contribution because of that. Um, you could also argue that it wasn't a super effort based contribution by Why Not because it's a straight sample. He just pretty much takes the whole groove, adds some hip hop drums and that's it. And it winds up being the lead single commercially off of this album. So you could say, you know, it's a great way to have ended that relationship because it winds up being one of the last times that they worked together, especially the last time in the 90s, uh, as far as rapping, straight producing, it's that's it. So, so it turns out to be a good look. 
And now we talk about Doug Inf, who historically has provided the more upbeat and, and springy type sounds on common projects. And that's no less the case here. So you get tracks like Real Nigger Quotes, which uses these blaring old timey horns in different octaves and different manipulations of it, right? So you get these notes that go up, these two big notes that go up, and then these lower notes that go down. And that's pretty much the flow of the whole beat, but it's up tempo, it's energetic the whole time, lots of scratches to keep that super hip hop feel. And that's the same thing you're gonna get on One Too Many, where Doug Infinite samples from maybe one of the most unlikely places from a soundtrack from a Mel Brooks movie, which sounds like something from like Home Alone. But Doug Infinite has a way of making it sound super hip hop, so much so that this was the street single back in the 90s, the, the concept of the street single that the DJs were playing when the album was first coming out. So you had reminded me of Seth commercially and you had one too many with tons and tons of scratches, but these bells and whistles from this movie soundtrack that made it energetic and Commons just matching that. And so that's the, the, the trifecta there. That's the very last time in the 90s and for a long time that you're hearing any of those three producers on a common project let's go back to talking about no id for what he described being last minute contributions or an afterthought we just gave common a bunch of beats to pick from you would never know it because this is arguably no id at his 90s finest we heard what he could do on resurrection with samples but there's about three levels of sampling that happens on this album with no ideas production or, or three levels of production approaches right so no id here is giving you a range you're getting a mixture a vast array of tempos from food for funk which is probably the most original production from him here which is up tempo to the slowest tracks on here like god which is really just like this stripped down piano driven methodical production now when we talk about sampling you get more direct sampling like what he does with introspective and getting down at the amphitheater where he's basically just taking the original material and maybe beefing it up with some drums and bass lines but that's about the extent of it especially getting down at the amphitheater where he's just sampling gangbusters from the wild style soundtrack most of you may know it from and it's just this hip-hop b-boy free-for-all but not a lot of variations and changes to the original material introspective is that same way he takes this jazz loop and that's the beat but then you get more intricate sampling um like what he does with the stolen moments series and so stolen moments part one and two i would argue are probably the most overlooked hip hop production besides maybe Killer Army in this era of the 90s that I think a lot of hip hop purists missed out on. I feel like these are beats that the average backpacker or hip hop head, underground hip hop head especially, would have drooled to rap over if they got their hands on the instrumental, but it's so associated with what Common did over it that you miss the nuances here. And so, no ID sampling from everything from the Fania All-Stars, which is classic, classic Latin jazz and salsa music, to, to Frank Purcell interpreting Beatles music for like this beautiful medley of woodwind instruments, classical sounds, uh, mixing gothic and cinematic approaches with undeniable boom bap hip hop. So if we take Stolen Moments part two, the movements in that starts off with these grandiose strings, like something's gonna happen, something that RZA would have done. And then it goes into this second progression when the verses start, where it just allows Common to, to flow over. And then it goes back for, you know, the hook and the ending of it. So that's where you're seeing the, the real sampling mind of no idea at work. And somewhere in the middle, you get tracks like Making a Name for Ourselves, where he samples Henry Mancini, pretty straightforward, but at different parts and puts it together. And he's able to match the menace that that beat was supposed to present in relation to what the rappers are doing on it, right? So you get these levels where it's it, it may seem lazy on one end, more intricate on another, and right in the middle, but that's 
range and you can afford to do that when you're producing 11 tracks on an album. That's no ID right there. Giving you everything from funk to jazz to piano to classical. And um, we want to talk about the contributions from James Poyser here who plays the keys and the organ on Retrospect for Life, which is supposed to be a double interpolation, one of Stevie Wonder's I Never Dream You Leaving Summer and another of Donny Hathaway's Song For You. Both soul music classics, both very sad songs, so pretty deliberate in trying to evoke the mood. Same thing with Spike Rebel, who adds jazzy sentiments to some of the other tracks, especially the poetry, the spoken word solo. Speaking of live music, you also get the more pronounced presence of Kareem Riggins, who becomes this longtime common collaborator uh, as he moves more into live music incorporated on his albums, especially for the pops rap segments. And that just becomes a part of this, this transition that we see Common go into later on, which takes us to The Roots, who show up here producing under their Grand Negas uh, imprint and they provide a pretty lighthearted but soulful backdrop for all night long so that is the scope of the production on here you get in a mix something for you to consider on a scale for one to five heartbeats how good do you think it was that takes us to dimension two the cohesiveness when we talk about different producers having different ideas different feels and it all working together well this album could be an example of how that goes. Uh, we pointed out that Doug Infinite is gonna bring more of the, the upbeat, springy, kind of animated production, which match more of Common's old style, but fits in pretty well here and comes right at the points that it needs to. This dimension always begs the question of the importance of sequencing. This album might be one of the better sequence albums of 1997. You could argue that the beats behind G.O.D. and Retrospect for Life are pretty similar being that they are these stripped down, mostly piano driven beats. If we take away the piano chords that are played over it, uh, then they really become like these two note beats with sleigh bell drums or like hi-hats or really muted drums. But the question is, could you swap their placement somewhere else? I think Retrospect for Life coming so early in the album is a part of what we'll talk about in the next dimension where it sets a tone. Uh, it could have come later, but this is what distinguishes this album from the other albums that Common had released and released afterwards. And G.O.D. coming only two songs after that may have been too close considering that there's no other songs afterwards that have that same pacing and feel. And so, yeah, the idea is where could this have been swapped out? Could the album have ended with G.O.D. since it's such a strong, you know, message-based song? Or is it just right where it's at, right? There's the idea that maybe if Reminding Me of Seth had been in the place of G.O.D., it could have ended with this strong note or if G.O.D. was a retrospect for life's placement, would we have gotten a different feel for the album? There's the idea that sonically, this could have been moved further away from that. You don't hear the jazzy songs next to each other. And the only reason that you hear the classical songs next to each other is that they're all a part of the same series of three songs telling one story. Um, so that may be the only stutter step here. There's a balance here of tempos right after songs like Retrospect for Life where it slows down. You come back up with Getting Down at the Amphitheater and Food for Funk, which are maybe the most up-tempo songs besides what Doug Infinite did on the second side if you had the tape back in the days, One Too Many. Um, Invocation and Hungry seem to be parallels of each other. It's like, here's my I'm spitting and I'm coming with lyricism to let you know we're setting things off. And again, if you had the tape back in the days, Invocation is at that place on the first side. And on the second side, it begins with Hungry, which lets you know, oh no, I'm still spitting, right? So two different feels, but what parallels is the fact that Com is attacking with, with just no hook, just short verse format. So you can tell there was a lot of thought in the sequencing, even with breaking up the stories how Stolen Moments 1 and 2 flow beautifully into each other because it's different plays 
off of woodwind instruments and classical sounds from different sources. But as soon as the last word on Stolen Moments Part 1 ends, it goes right perfectly into Stolen Moments Part 2, but still evoking a different feel. Genius work there with the sequencing. He takes a break from that to, you know, highlight Doug Infinite's production, then come back to the story just when you forgot it to wrap it up and it takes you somewhere else. And so the second side seems to be more bar heavy. You're not getting as much uh, weight topically as you're getting on the first side. Besides All Night Long where Kam is dropping some lines in there and reminding me of Seth, you're not getting anything heavy handed. And so that could make it seem a little skewed and imbalanced too. And I think all of that could be changed by where you move the G.O.D. song. That's all something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats, the sequencing, the cohesiveness and flow of the album in the sonic bed. So dimension three, the question of intentional mood or tone. We can never really think for the rapper unless we have them sitting there and even then only believe a percentage of what you hear because so much time has passed. Sometimes the rappers don't remember details and rappers always kind of have a sense of self, right? The idea is to think back to what was trying to be presented here. What you're getting is symbolic of the name change on the cover. It's not just this idea that legally there's no more common sense, it's just common. This is a new introduction to me. This is a super duper transitional period in Common's career where he's combining everything that has made him up until that point. And so one of the distinctive things that get left behind is how Common approaches songs here and the weight of what he's doing. We've heard him touch on topics on the previous two albums, but he's getting into heavy, deep introspection and, and social issues and material. Uh, and you can tell, you know, I always joke that he's been reading right uh on god he mentions reading the bible and quran and how you got to read those boys and retrospect for life this is common breaking new ground not just for himself but for hip-hop because never before had we heard at least not in such a, an obvious or prominent way as a, as a commercial single a male rapper talking about abortion and then more more of that you know, personally, in Common's life, he just become a father, so you're hearing him talk more from a perspective of fatherhood. He has a line there where he's like, I scream at the world, but having a daughter saw the cop block. And even in his, the, the lines that he's slipping in, Common is telling you where he's at, talking about how he's thinking about putting the liquor down and picking up a new habit. How can he make a new life? How can he settle down with a woman instead of getting with whatever is going on for tonight? Um, you start to hear him mention things like Nag Champa and, you know, things that would be associated with Common probably for the rest of his career after this. It's, it's clear that he's heading in a different direction. Uh, and I think he wants you all to know that. Some of that is earnestness, like it's coming because he can't help it, that's where he's from. And some of it is, y'all come with me where I'm going. Also, whereas on previous albums, it might have felt like he was embracing his underground stance. Uh, on this album, he's very aware that there's a new height to attain and he's interested in attaining it, but very concerned still with doing it on his terms. So when you hear him make lines about commercial records and commercial rappers like out of proportion, hit makers get blown. It's like, yeah, they cool and all. He's not hated on the commercial rappers. So he is in that division that started in 96, the underground versus mainstream, but he's not sounding as salty. He's sounding more like, I can do that too, if I wanted to. That's kind of the, the real sub sub kind of sentiment that you'll hear that's not really, you know, too pronounced on this album. You're not getting a lot of that, but it's there. And it's a more ambitious comment who's more attuned to the industry and cares more about how to play the game and uh, those are really really not easy things to pick up on but you'll hear it the live music aspects of this album the more soul based and, and more reined in effects and we'll talk about more of the technical stuff in category two we'll talk about his rap style on here but you're hearing the maturation of common on here 
in every aspect, from the sounds pick, from the sequencing, from what he's talking about, and from some of the full songs themselves. And I think it's pretty obvious. I don't think a lot of that is up for interpretation. I've read things that said that this sounded like where Common got soft, but I don't know if we can get much softer than the animated jingle using style that he came out with and was catching flat for too over jazzy, super jazzy samples. In hindsight, as much as people like Resurrection, I would say if we're talking in conversations of softness, that that kind of work would be seen as softer than what was done here on this album. But something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats, that takes us to dimension four. The song distinction and repetition factor, right? So you get no IDs range, which we talked about pretty heavily. And uh, we talked about tempo and, and how he's giving you these dynamics of different layers of approaching sampling throughout the different songs. You're getting not a lot of room here for, for repeats. Even the instruments you use, you're getting um, different kinds of keyboard sounds. You're getting saxophones. <laughs> you're getting bells and whistles, as I mentioned. Then you're getting electro funk and menacing bass lines. I would argue that there's no repetition on this album from the production side of things. And if we're talking about words and sounds, what Common is doing here, this is Common that is most hungry and controlled in the 90s. He knows what he wants to say on this microphone, and he is bobbing and weaving out of words and verses like he has something to prove, even though he seems the most comfortable ever. He is embodying wordsmith at this point all throughout this album. Not any repetition that's not intentional with him referencing things in Chicago or the city of Chicago itself and his name, of course. This is still calm, loving to play off of his name and the COM portion of his name. But all of that is intentional, not lazy, something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. That takes us to dimension five, the ratio of content versus the amount of songs. Now, this album has 17 tracks and no skits really, unless we're counting Pop's rap as a skit and the introduction, which is titled Introspective and is common talking at the beginning. Um, now, if we're considering that content, then it kind of tips the scales a little, but let's assume we're not considering Pop's rap and in introspective in this content and we're focusing strictly on songs. We discussed in the previous dimensions how the the weight of the topics discussed on gaining one's definition god and retrospect for life alone could usually satisfy this dimension for any album because there's such big big topics but he goes on and and sprinkles commentary on songs like all night long and reminding me of seth and then if we consider the storytelling songs as content, then you're getting almost half the album littered with subjects and content that sees Common testing the limits of where he goes just beyond battle rap and braggadocio. So that's all something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. That takes us to dimension six, the features. Now, on here, uh, if we count Malik Youssef, who gets his own solo, his own spoken word solo. Uh, he shares my name, so shout out to the brother Malik Youssef. He was doing deaf poetry before deaf poets were even a thing and before it caught on and became this wave that everybody was riding. And he provided a very Chicago feel by just speaking on the city, on the track, the city. And it also meshes with the jazz background that was prominent throughout the album in different pockets. So that's the, the vertical that he was landing upon, the jazz and Chicago aspect of things. You also get famously uh, Lauren Hill on Retrospect for Life, which hands down the biggest feature on here because this was the year in between the mega albums, the score by the Fugees and Lauren Hill's own debut, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. She didn't do a lot of features. This was always a big deal when she stepped out outside of the Fuji's realm and showed you 
her range before we knew the full extent. So people were really tuned in to see. And, and it, it can be argued that Lauren helped tip the commercial scales in Common's favor for the single besides what he was talking about. Uh, she sings on here. No ID says that he always thought that Erica Badu would have been a better fit on Retrospect for Life and Lauren Hill would have been a better fit on All Night Long. What do y'all think? This is why albums are the product of different minds coming together. And, and thank God for that, because different people have different ideas. Now, let's talk about Erica Badu on All Night Long. In retrospect, this could be seen as the Mr. and Mrs. Smith moment, right? Where uh, if you're familiar with the history of that movie, a lot of people assume and cite that set as the beginning of Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie's relationship. It would seem, uh, even though the, the light video was what really brought it to light, this song was what sparked uh, the, the beginning of the embers of the flame of the Eric Badu in common relationship. And uh, you can hear the chemistry in that song. He makes different references cleverly to Erica Badu's song On and On, and you can tell that she was in the same space as Lauren Hill was because her debut single and album had just dropped and people didn't know how big she was going to be, but it seemed like Common knew and he was just primed for it. Uh, so much so that this song winds up having like four verses, which was unheard of in that era. And they kind of just drew this song out. No chance of it really being a, a standard radio single, even though it was treated as a single. But man, they were just having fun. You could tell it was a jam session. And so Erica Badu, Lauren Hill, Malik Youssef. Then you get CeeLo Green on Gaining One's Definition, God, um, or G-O-D. You get De La Soul on Getting Down at the Amphitheater. And you get Cannabis, which I'd say Cannabis was in the very same position as Erica Badu. This is the year of his solo album being released. And I always thought that this collaboration was a first dibs kind of thing. Everyone was clamoring to get Cannabis on a song after Beast from the East from Lost Boys, shout out to Lost Boys, came out. And it seems very much so that Common snatched this feature up through whatever connections he had immediately after that. I don't think this song, it doesn't sound like this song was made while there was anything else out from Cannabis. No second round knockout yet, no, no album out, even though the album might have been out by the time this album came out. It sounded like this was very much so recorded, like, yo, I want the hottest rapper to do this feature with me and go back and forth with me for this contrast. And, and that's what you wind up getting. Uh, when this song came out, we didn't have the language back then to say, oh, this person killed you on your own song because it just wasn't the, the thing that you run out and say just because somebody had someone doing something different on the track. But in hindsight, everyone unanimously says that the cannabis went harder on this song. And it's not just because of cannabis having a more aggressive style. If you look back, if you listen to the verses that Common has on this song, it almost seems like he took a back seat. And you can say that about all of the rap features on this album, because there's solo songs where Common raps more aggressively, like Invocation, Hungry, and One Too Many, where he's just going off with bars and lines. And it seems like on the songs with guests, he's like, y'all do your thing. You know, on getting down at the amphitheater, everyone's on the same level. No one really outshines anyone, uh, which is not hard to do with, with De La Sad to say, because Common is definitely more of a put words together rapper. More connectivity and relatability with his lyrics. We've talked about some of De La's approaches on, on other albums. And if we think about a song like The Business from their Stakes Is High album, Common was the, the outshiner on there. On Getting Down at the Amphitheater, everybody seems to be on the same level, where on G.O.D., CeeLo goes off. You know, I think CeeLo winds up making stronger points about spirituality than Common, even though Common starts it off. But I think it's an alley-oop, because Common is really trying to lay the foundation of what the song is about, so CeeLo can go off. And that's kind of what you see on Making a Name for Ourselves. It's like, 
I'm gonna set up this plate cannabis, you take it home. The cannabis is going in with all of these comparative bars and just, you know, his punch lines and his, the things that made cannabis the name to look out for in 1997. Also, you have Black Thought and you have Q-Tip who are only featured on the choruses of the Stolen Moments part two and part three songs. Uh, to kind of build it up. It, it takes it to a next level each time. And I thought it was interesting that Black Thought comes in and he's hyping up the intro for part two. And then he even does this sing soggy cadence to, to give it a different feel uh, and switch it up. And comes on at the end and is interpolating Q-Tip's famous sucker nigga refrain and hook. Uh, hey sucker nigga, wherever you are just for Q-Tip to come in on part three and rehash that and do that. And then it seems like after Common's verse, Common just lets Q-Tip take it out with ad-libs. And you know, when you let Q-Tip ad-lib, you're liable to get anything and you do. It ain't sweet when you do that. It's Q-Tip, it's Q-Tip, Q-Tip. And, and um, you know, I've seen in reviews saying that it was pretty cocky and it shows Common's confidence throughout this album of the fact that he didn't play off his associations and those features to use them for verses, to accent the songs, he got it. He just needed them to play wingman, and, and that's what they did. If you consider Black Thought and Q-Tip's presences as a waste, that they didn't spit bars and you're mad at those songs because they didn't add to it, uh, it could be argued, what would they do to the story? How could they chime in on a story that is, is a very common centered story uh, about him and his experience in his apartment. It, it might have taken away to have them on there like, oh, calm, I feel you. I think I see them coming up the back and made it more fictional than anything. Uh, it was very believable coming from the first person perspective with the friend in the background. So I, I think they did their parts on it. I think Q-Tip and, and Black Thought added a nice change of voice and tone, but Sprinkle in an accent. That's all that's all that was needed. Then you have Shantae Savage on Reminding Me of Seth, which has gotten mixed reactions when I look online and I see people looking back on this song. Some people feel like her voice was too strong to interpret the Patrice Russian song, which is a classic that most people love dearly. Uh, remind me over the other sample that is the beat itself, and some people love it because it's a contrast to common smooth voice and she's coming in strong and powerful representing Chicago soul. Those are your features on the album as far as who's actually performing in front of the mic. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats that takes us to dimension seven. The question of what is the weakest song on the album and do the weakest song or songs bring it down. Always a subjective dimension here. Uh, if you do not like singers on hooks, there's a good amount of that and there's about four or five songs here that you're not gonna like because Reminded Me of Seth, G.O.D., Retrospect for Life, All Night Long definitely has singing. If you don't like some of the guest features, well then that's gonna taint and bias some of uh, how you perceive the album. If you don't want to hear Common Get Out Shine too, that's something else to factor, but off sheer shrink of production and bars together, it can be argued that Food for Funk is the most forgettable song on this album. Uh, in all the reviews, I never hear much mention about that song. I don't hear anyone talking about it. It's a really simple beat on No IDs and, and Common is not coming with lines that are particularly memorable like he does on other songs on this album. It just seemed like he needed another up-tempo song and it's there. Does it bring the album down in any way? It fills its purpose because it's another much needed up-tempo song between Retrospect for Life and G.O.D. But always something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. That takes us to Dimension 8, Mass Appeal. 1997, guaranteed three singles and three videos. This is the last leg of Relativity Records and surprisingly this album churned out multiple singles and you got more output from relativity than a lot of the labels that were bigger at the time i guess they were going out with a bang 
And so your lead off single, as we mentioned, is Reminding Me of Steph. And that is the Chicago homage. In the video, they're doing so many B-roll shots and emphasizing Chicago culture at the time that if you weren't from there, you're kind of drawn to it. If you're from there and you were tapped into Common at the time, then it really felt like a homecoming. They're at riverboats. They're, they got the, the famous theaters and the, the elevated L train behind them. They're doing stepping dances in there and they're riding the bus. This entire song lays out the blueprint for the video just from listening to the song, but seeing the video added this feel to it. And the, the video ends with this shot of him walking away like that, that feeling you get when you're leaving at 2 a.m. from a party that fulfilled everything it was supposed to be. Uh, they stated that the video for Retrospect for Life was Common's first acting role. Him and Lauren, it's this family-based video. There's like this birthday party and then He's thinking out loud in this soliloquy monologue on the rooftop, and you really get the feeling that this is a emotional song here, and it's intended to speak for those who haven't had this topic spoken on, and you're seeing that. You're seeing what Common wanted you to get out of this. Now, All Night Long is, is a single that didn't really get any radio play. Uh, if y'all are from Chicago, y'all can tell me if it got knocked there, and if they like modified it because like i said it is beyond the scope and and the time limits of a traditional radio song back in those days and back in any time really it goes on and on shout out to erica and the street singles are one too many and that turns out to be like a dj street single that never gets the video treatment but then you get the split video which i used to go crazy for back in the days of invocation and hungry complex says hungry is commons most lyrical best lyrical song of all time and uh that's that's why we're here to talk about stuff like that but you, you're seeing effort put in how many different angles needed to be hit now that we're reintroducing common sense as common and i think they did a good job putting out different feelers to see what stuck and what didn't. And from this, you never saw Common deviate from this formula. Common wants you to remember that he spits, he wants you to know that he loves women and he's into women, and he's always going to have some conscious sentiment to what he's doing. So the only songs that got played with features on them are the ones with singers, Shante Savage, Lauren Hill, and Erica Badu, all the female singers get their their shine on singles. The ones with the male features don't see the light of day as singles, but you know they're there. That's why you go check out the album. Did this make any difference in Common's units? It winds up selling more than his previous two albums and it gives him, to, at that point in his career, the most commercial success that he was able to touch because these videos got a lot of rotation Retrospect for Life winds up being critically acclaimed in hip hop history and starts hitting these markets that Common wasn't hitting before, like with the college crowd, with, with women particularly, and, and people who wouldn't normally tune into Common music. Now he's on people's radar more than he ever was in this phase in his life. Yeah, this was Common's height right here, but still enough fuel for him to be able to say on the next album, this never went gold, nigga. So he still didn't touch any significant mark, but it was a success and a move up for him career-wise and, and a sign of things to come on the horizon. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats that takes us to Dimension Nine, my favorite, the three eyes: Impact, Innovation, Influence. Now, people tend to have mixed reviews and reactions to this album because it's perfectly sandwiched between the other two hotly talked about and, and what people consider to be his best albums like Water for Chocolate and Resurrection. Uh, this is personally my favorite album of Commons because it seems to be the most balanced. Uh, the, the, the best of both worlds where Commons still cared about killing the mic in a way where he's not overcompensating but then also not beating you over the head with earthiness and love y'all. <laughs> The kind of 
campy righteousness that he's been branded with since then. We talk about the waves this album made when it was released. It may not have been critically helmed as an entire body of work, but his singles were powerful and the album tracks with features. The song with Cannabis was talked about for the rest of that year and Retrospect for Life was continues to be talked about to this day. Uh, Common once again pioneering and breaking new ground like what he did with I Used to Love Her. Even though he didn't invent the will, those who make the most indelible mark are who we associated with. So him introducing the beautiful concept of rapping about something as a woman is forever kind of associated with him, just like him being that guy that made the abortion song and, and understands women and understands the nuances and complexities of trying to create a family, right? Uh, black man talking about fatherhood. That's the impact, that's the ripple effect from this album. If you were able to go deeper and you were listening to it, people still talk about the G.O.D. song with CeeLo because we hadn't heard anybody on Wax talk about the Bible and the Quran with equality. It's usually, you know, we had our sets, we had our Christian rappers, but we had our five percenters, and then you just have a whole bunch of other people, and you, then you had some straight Muslim rappers or who were connected to Nation of Islam, but for somebody to be like, look, I don't know the answer, but I'm seeking them and I'm looking and starting here. And then you have CeeLo, who's directly speaking to people who are part of the 5% nation and saying, you know, if you're gonna call yourself gods, here's what I need you to do for your people. Here's what you need to live up to if you're gonna use that title. Just stuff that's never been spoken on, right? So people talk about that kind of stuff. We're now talking about No ID's impact in the hip hop world and people going back and discovering the production that he did on this album. Now, as far as influence, when rappers cite Common as one of their favorites, I'm assuming that this is an album that they paid attention to and acknowledged, but uh, it's not an album that you hear people talk about directly, like, hey, this is the album that did something for me. You're not gonna hear many people talk about it, except for probably me. This album was a game changer for me. Because of the impact of what Common was doing here, I think he opened the gates for rappers to be more vulnerable and introspective. And I think he brought the word introspect and retrospect to the hip hop world. And, you know, unfortunately, I think the storytelling on this album gets overlooked. And it's probably some of the best hip hop storytelling you're ever gonna hear. We'll talk more about that in the next category, but this is all something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats, takes us to the final dimension, dimension 10, the overall timelessness and uniqueness of this album. So, because there's a soul base at this album, most of the beats on here don't suffer from that dated quality. You might be able to argue that beats like one too many real nigga quotes from Doug Infinite sound a little bit like they belonged in the earlier 90s and maybe that's those of you who remember how common used to rap over beats more uh typically of that that ilk but somehow they work and they fit because those sample sounds are so rich and so undeniably hip-hop then you have the slow quality of god and retrospect for life that may feel like okay this wouldn't work today because he sound like rap ballads which we've talked about ghostface really you know bringing into hip-hop culture and maybe when you look back on it they're too simplified or maybe you look back on them as beautiful pieces of music that are genre list that been the limits of hip-hop like hey common's rapping over these ballad sounds and then you know you get beats like food for funk which are electron electro funk in nature and if you're not big on funk that may sound dated but really not a lot of elements here that make the album sound like it was 1997. It sounds like it could have been made uh, before its time or after its time because it's so soul-based and, and there's such a range of sounds. Now, what Common's talking about on the mic also doesn't contribute to the data quality. Everything's still relevant to this day because he's talking about never-ending topics and even his references in punchlines and things like that are not so much of the era where it's like, ooh, that's played out now. On songs like Stolen Moments, he's talking about uh, Alpha Bailey jackets, Iverson sneakers, VCRs, 
but there's a beauty and a nostalgia there just to see what someone would be concerned about at the time in in the scope of a, a break-in and losing their possessions so really these are all things to consider the uniqueness and timelessness it doesn't sound like many of the things that were out in 1997 because it was a very polarized year and it's something that doesn't lose its crispness when you put it in today but that's for you to determine on a scale from one to five heartbeats and that concludes the dimension one review of the classic album turning 25 years old today one day it all makes sense by the artist formerly known as common sense common and join us for the next video where we go into category two which is the rap performance on this album until then y'all know what it is f a rap critic we talk about it while i live it word to meth